Okay, good afternoon. Let me start by saying thank you to the organizers of this wonderful event. And um, congratulations also to Lizzie Cowling on the, the beautiful exhibition that's at the museum. Uh, I, I want to start today, I think that would be the first, yes, great. I, I want to speak this afternoon about a, a fantastic book. I want to pay homage to John Berger, whom you see here on the left, who was born in 1926 and died earlier this year, one of the great critics of the 20th century and the author of the book on the right, which I think is, remains one of the best books about Picasso, even though it's now almost 50 years, well, not almost, more than 50 years old. And there's a passage in this book that has fascinated me for many years. And this is a, on, on page 40, Berger writes, he's talking about Ortega y Gasset, the great Spanish critic, and what he had written, um, not about Picasso. Uh, Berger quotes him, Ortega y Gasset invented a phrase, the vertical invader, which is so apt for Picasso, Berger says. He, Ortega, is generalizing about the modern European masses. Onto them, he projects all his aristocratic fears of the underprivileged and uneducated. And Berger then goes on to quote Ortega, and he says, this is Ortega speaking now, but in Berger, the European who is beginning to predominate must then be in relation to the complex civilization into which he has been born, a primitive man, a barbarian appearing on stage through a trap door, a vertical invader. And Berger continues, now back in his own voice, Picasso came up from Spain through the trap door of Barcelona, and here we are, I didn't realize this was a trap door, but apparently it is, through the trap door of Barcelona, onto the stage of Europe. That's a very vivid metaphor. At first, he was repulsed. Quite quickly, he gained a bridgehead. Finally, he became a conqueror. But always, I am convinced, again, this is still John Berger speaking, but always, he has remained conscious of being a vertical invader. Always, he has subjected what he has seen around him in France to a comparison with what he brought with him from his own country, from the past. So he's thinking of Spain in some sense as the past. Berger is using Ortega's concept of the vertical invader to characterize Picasso as a primitive man and a barbarian confronting a more advanced civilization. So here we find an early instance of the idea of primitivism, which became so controversial in the 1980s with the famous or notorious exhibition of William Rubin and Kirk Varnado, but projected back onto Picasso many years before Rubin and, and Varnado's show. So this idea of Picasso as a barbarian, uh, if that's an identity, has played a very important role in discussions of Picasso's late work, and particularly his studies after the old masters, and I promised eventually I will show you some paintings by Picasso. But, but I wanted to, in the meantime, quote Marie-Laure Bernadac, who writes in Picasso et les Maîtres, like all cannibals, Picasso thinks that you can appropriate someone's power by eating his body. Maybe this wasn't the best time to speak about this right after lunch. <laughs> Hence, hence that voracious appetite that leads him to devour his masters. And similarly, Anne Baldessari refers to Picasso's studies after the old masters as a pictorial cannibalism without precedent. So the, the tacit reference in these texts seems to be to the Cannibal Manifesto that was published in 1928 by the Brazilian critic Oswald de Andrade calling for non-European artists to devour European art and remake it in their own image. The implication here is that even at the pinnacle of his own success, Picasso remains an outsider, confronting the history of European art with destructive rage. 
Now, I wanted to dig a little deeper into this question of what is a vertical invader? What does Berger mean by it? What does Ortega mean by it? And it turns out that the genealogy of this idea is quite complicated. Berger gets it from Ortega, not from the dehumanization of art, which you all know, but from a less well-known book, The Revolt of the Masses, or The Rebellion of the Masses, in Spanish. And Ortega turns out to have gotten the idea, although not the phrase, from the German industrialist and social critic Walter Ratzenau. And I'm showing you Ortega on the left and Ratzenau on the right. Ratzenau, of course, is a kind of martyr of the European left, having been assassinated by a right-wing German group in 1922. So in his 1917 book, Von Kommenden Dingen, uh, Ratzenau argues that industrialization has brought about a transformation in the structure of modern society. Until the late 18th century, he says, history meant the history of the aristocratic upper stratum of European society, an international class bound together by kinship rather than by national identity. It's interesting to think about a time when Europe was not consumed by questions of national identity, but obviously now is different. This, this, uh, this, this old society, the Ancien Régime, changes after 1900, and Rattenau writes, with the opening of the 19th century, the people of the lower stratum entered upon the stage of history. Those who br- so this is where Ortega gets the metaphor of the stage and the trapdoor. Those who brought mechanization into being stap- stamped upon the epoch their imprint of ancient servitude. The new nation was a nation of primitive men with a veneer of civilization. So Ratzenau's influence, which again stands behind Berger's analysis of Picasso, is obviously influenced by social Darwinism. The idea that different races and classes correspond to different steps on the ladder of of evolution. Also evidently reflects Nietzsche's contrast between what he considers the role of the noble mentality of the pagan aristocracy and the slave mentality of Christianity. So there's a great deal packed into this idea of the vertical invader. Ortega borrows the idea of the stage and and, and condenses Rathenau's argument into vertical invader. So from this perspective, Picasso as vertical invader becomes a representative of the working class. Now at first glance, this may seem strange, maybe even absurd. But as William Rubin noted many years ago, during the Cubist years, Picasso and Brock liked to play at being simple laborers, wearing the overalls known as bleu de travail. Kahnweiler records that, and this is a quote from Kahnweiler's memoirs, they arrived one day at the gallery, cap in hand, acting like laborers, Boss, they demanded, we're here for our pay. So the the avant-garde artist is proletarian. Now, Ortega y Gasset recapitulates Rathenau's argument in La Rebellion de las Masas and equates the rebellion of the masses with the vertical invasion, but he takes this idea in a different direction. He emphasizes the central role of technology in modern society, and then he points out that from a scientific point of view, We are all barbarians. The working class laborer drives an automobile and takes an aspirin to relieve his pains without understanding the scientific principles behind these modern miracles. But so does the artist, and so does the art historian. Even scientists are ignoramuses outside their areas of specialization. Indeed, Ortega writes, The actual scientific man is the prototype of the mass man, a primitive, a barbarian. So it's here that Ortega's argument in the rebellion of the masses intersects with that of the dehumanization of art, where he says that avant-garde art focuses exclusively on problems of form, hence its dehumanization, and that therefore it is of interest only to artists and other specialists. The mass public prefers an intelligible art depicting recognizable figures and landscapes. The vertical invader, in other words, is an uneducated consumer. Now, I want to take this intellectual background and try to apply it to a few moments in in Picasso's work. Obviously, there isn't time to look the whole thing. But let's start with something fairly early. Um, On the right, a picture I believe you're all familiar with. 
On, on the left, one you may not know, this is by Frantisek Kupka, an early work called Anthropoids from 1902. Now, as Patricia Layton and Anna Chave and David Lomas and Anne Baldessari have all argued, there is a kind of social Darwinism at work in the iconography of the Demoiselle d'Avignon, a suggestion that the workers in the sex trade belong to a more primitive stage of evolution, symbolized by the famous African masks in the repainted version of the canvas. So we might link these interpretations to Rattenau's description of modern Europe invaded by a race of primitive men, or in this case, primitive women. And I think a similar combination of evolutionary and racial ideas can be found here in Kupka's painting, where two Neanderthal men fighting for the favor of a woman holding a bouquet of flowers. I love that detail. Are, the two men are clearly marked as belonging to darker races, more violent and more passionate. So Kupka's painting looks absurd to 21st century eyes, I hope. And I worry, however, that a little bit of this absurdity perhaps also attaches to the Demoiselle d'Avignon, or should, should per, attach to the Demoiselle d'Avignon. Now, what about Ortega's interpretation of the vertical invader and uh, cubism, the more advanced stages in Picasso's work. Um, here I'm showing you uh, on the left, uh, Picasso's Girl with the Mandolin in the Modern in New York from 1910, and on the right, a Camille Corot, seated Italian girl playing the mandolin from 1865-70, the, the kind of painting that Picasso probably had in mind when he chose this motif. So at first glance, Picasso's painting of 1910 looks like an example of the dehumanization discussed by Ortega. Uh, following the argument of Ortega's 1925 essay, we might read Picasso's painting as a vertical invader's act of aggression against the European tradition, a premonitory example of the spirit of Dada. And there isn't time to go into this, but you know, much of Dada, if you look at the movement as a whole, actually consists of what looked to us like rather tame, cubist-style paintings, but at the time they were perceived as extremely aggressive and nihilistic. But what if we took a different perspective on the girl with the mandolin and introduced a different comparison? This, believe it or not, is a contemporary work by a leading Chinese artist, Chen Yifei. Uh, pipa, the pipa is the kind of lute that the woman is playing. This was painted in 1988. Um, you're thinking, I'm sorry, Gu Wenda, yes, Zhu Bing, yes, Wang Guan Yi, yes, but who the hell is Chen Yifei? Actually, Chen Yifei made a tremendous reputation in New York in the, the 1980s um, with paintings like this one. Indeed, this one was exhibited by Armand Hammer in 1988. Now, if we compare the Picasso to the Chen Yifei, then the Picasso begins to look like an example of elite high art rather than popular kitsch. And in this case, it's Chen Yifei who appears as the vertical invader. So it seems to me that the, the, the question of identity is extremely mobile, that the invader, what's high, what's low, shifts. It's not just something that attaches to a given artist or a given work, but changes on the circumstances and the, the comparisons um, that we use to make, to, to address a picture. Now, I'd like to go to a much later period of Picasso's career, um, the epoch of the studies after the old masters, but here I'd like to begin with a very rapid review of different ways that other artists have used the old master tradition. So here to take a, a time-honored example, on the left, Velasquez's portrait of Menippus, the, the Greek philosopher, on the right, um, Manet's A Philosopher Beggar with Oysters from 1864-67. Here we can see how Manet has borrowed both subject matter and style from Velasquez and used them to create a distinctive version of 19th century realism different from the realism of Courbet, Millet, and Daumier. On the other hand, here's a very different example of borrowing from the old masters. On the left, Ang's portrait of Napoleon. On the right, the contemporary artist Gehinda Wiley, a portrait of the rapper Ice-T, painted in 2005. So Wiley is borrowing the style and iconography of Ang's painting in order to assault the assumption that power and culture are possessions reserved for white men with a European education. 
Wiley depicts the rapper Ice-T as a vertical invader of the musical tradition, of a cultural tradition, and by, position, and by implication, Wiley positions himself as an artistic invader of, the art, of Western artistic tradition. Now let's bring this back to Picasso. Picasso's Three Dancers in the Tate collection on the right here stages a similar assault on the neoclassical imagery of his own work. His sedate, elegant graces become distorted back in the alien dancers. There is a catalytic role here, I believe, for Picabia that Orly Verdier is working on, but not enough time to go into that. This seems to me like a different case. We're advancing in time to 1950. This is Picasso's Young Women on the Banks of the Seine after Courbet and beneath it the Courbet original of 1856. Here, Picasso borrows only the motif from Courbet, not at all the style. And the image of two women on the banks of the river provides a kind of scaffolding around which uh, Picasso creates a radically new composition using a style that combines compartmentalization with an endless flickering subdivision. And th this new style can be seen as the culmination of a formal evolution that starts in the late 1930s. Again, that's for the 90-minute version of this lecture. The concept of the vertical invader, frankly, does not seem to apply here. It is a case of borrowing and reinvention, but not, I think, an invasion. Now, what about when we get to, when we get to get this move forward? Can you back at the podium advance this to the next image? It is not behaving well right now. Oh, no, that was too far. OK. Huh. All right. Well, I may have to, you know, here we go. They're out of order, but so be it. OK, uh, a painting you all know because it's in the museum right here, uh, Las Meninas after Velazquez I from August 17, 1957. It seems to me worth noting that this painting, which, you know, one of the, his great masterpieces, not sufficiently studied, combines two radically divergent styles. On the left, uh, the painting, the image is divided into compartments and patterns comparable to those of the 1950 study after Courbet. And Picasso's goal here is to create a modern personal equivalent to Velazquez. On the right, the figures and the objects are flattened in the silhouettes with crude cartoon-like contours. Here, I believe Picasso is playing the role of the vertical invader. He is deliberately desecrating the hallowed tradition of European art. This is what um, Bernadac and uh, Baldessari are referring to when they speak of him as a cannibal. And it's not a coincidence that when the collective Equipo Cronica created their parodies of Las Meninas in 1970, one of them was a copy of a Picasso in the style of the right, which is also, of course, here in the museum. Now, I want to wrap up by thinking about, OK, thank you. They're back again. Um, what happens in the next decade or so after this? In The Fool, on the right, this is from 1959, Picasso seems to bring these two goals together. On one hand, obviously, the image of a half-naked child frying eggs and it, it, with the eggs making a visual pun with his exposed testicles. This is a parody of the Velazquez. Um, on the other hand, there is a tremendous energy to the drawing and the coloring here. And this seems to me, this painting was just shown at Gagosian in New York in Diana Picasso's show. It's really a fantastic painting. What it adds is the theme of the child as a stand-in for the artist himself, which becomes increasingly important in the last decade or so of Picasso's work. Let's see if these are in order, more or less. No, let's go back to that. Uh, so here we have a, on the right the dwarf, Picasso's dwarf of 1969, clearly another homage to Velazquez's portrait of Sebastian del Moro. Note the, the yellow shoe soles here. But he's holding a stick. I mean, he's one of the musketeers, but he's holding a stick that looks like a paintbrush rather than a sword. Now, note that there is something deliberately childish about this. Uh, and many other pictures of this era have a childish quality. That the hair and the clothes are shaded with slashes of black and white across the bands of pure red, green, and blue. There's none of the complex interweaving of forms that we found in the study after Courbet. 
But there is something deceptive about Picasso's childishness. If you look at the foreshortening and the integration of the figure into a whole, no child could possibly have done this. This is not like the childish drawings of Du Buffet. It takes a, supreme, it takes a very well-trained, sophisticated artist to make something that has the appearance of childishness, but many of the qualities of adult art. But Picasso wants us to believe that he is painting like a child, which brings us to my last image. Yes, here. On the left, the young painter of 1972. As if to underscore this point about trying to paint like a child, Picasso creates an image of a young painter who looks like a child. This, this painting seems to me to just radiate the kind of joy in the act of picture making that must ultimately be rooted in Picasso's own childhood experience. And together with the dwarf of, of 1969 on the right, the picture reminds us that each new generation of human beings constitutes a band of vertical invaders who must somehow be integrated into our civilization However, as every parent can tell you, children are barbarians, but they are barbarians whom we welcome with love. Thank you. <laughs>